This is Space Time, Series 26, Episode 71. Coming up on Space Time, what made the brightest cosmic explosion of all time so exceptional? A new study identifies the mechanism driving the sun's fast winds, and NASA's Mars Ingenuity helicopter goes silent. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Few cosmic explosions have attracted as much attention from scientists as the one recorded on October the 22nd last year and aptly named the brightest of all time, or BOAT for short. The event, produced by the collapse of a massive star and the subsequent birth of a black hole, was witnessed as an immensely bright flash of gamma rays, followed by a slow fading afterglow of light visible across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Since picking up the boat's signal simultaneously on their telescopes around the world, astronomers have been scrambling to try and account for the brightness of the gamma ray burst and the curiously slow fed of its afterglow. The exceptionally long gamma ray burst is the brightest ever recorded, and its afterglow is smashing all records at all wavelengths. Because this burst was so bright and nearby, occurring just 2.4 billion light years away, astronomers think it's a once in a thousand year opportunity to address some of the most fundamental questions regarding these explosions, from the formation of black holes to new tests for dark matter. Now, astronomers reporting in the journal Science Advances have finally formulated an explanation to explain what happened. The authors say the initial burst, which was catalogued as GRB 221009A, was angled directly towards the Earth, and it also dragged along an unusually large amount of stellar material in its wake. The study's lead author, Brendan O'Connor from George Washington University, says the findings match other theoretical analyses of the afterglow, which also suggest that the jet must have been pointed directly at the Earth. However, the slow fade of the afterglow is not characteristic of a narrow jet of gas. And knowing this, may the authors suspect there must have been an additional reason for the intensity of the explosion. O'Connor and colleagues' mathematical models show that the gamma ray burst had a unique structure, with the observations gradually revealing a narrow jet embedded within a wider gas outflow where an isolated jet would normally be expected. So, what made this gamma ray burst wider than normal? Well, the authors think the gamma ray burst jets need to go through the collapsing star in which they're formed. And what made the difference in this case is the amount of mixing that happened between the stellar material and the jet, such that shock-headed gas kept appearing in our line of sight, all the way up to the point that any characteristic jet signature would have been lost in the overall emission of the afterglow. This new model helps not just to understand the boat, but also previous brightness record holders that had astronomers mystified about their lack of jet signature. These gamma-ray bursts, like other gamma-ray bursts, need to be directed straight towards the Earth when they happen, as it would be unphysical for so much energy to be expelled in all directions at once. O'Connor says an exceptional class of events appears to exist that are both extreme and still manage to mask the directed nature of their gas flow. He says future study into the magnetic fields at the launch of the jet and into the massive stars that host them should help reveal why these gamma-ray bursts are so rare. One of the things that first captured my attention about GRBs is just how explosive they are, how bright. The, the amount of energy that they release in the span of just a few seconds is actually more than our sun produces over its entire lifetime. And the reasons that we like to study GRBs and the things we can learn about them have to do with star formation. So these uh, long duration gamma ray bursts are caused by the collapse of massive stars and we can observe them due to their brightness all the way back to the first stars. So as we begin to probe these really high redshift, very distant gamma ray bursts, we can learn about how stars first formed, what environments they're forming in, what type of elements were existing at these times, and see how this star formation actually evolved over the history of the universe. GRB 221009A is the brightest gamma ray burst of all time. We have detected since the 1970s, well, we being space satellites, gamma ray satellites, about 10,000 gamma ray bursts. And this is by far the brightest by not just a little bit, but by a hundred times. It's a hugely different event. And based on the brightness and its proximity to us, we expect it to be a once in a century event, which means this is the only chance in our lifetime to study this type of explosion at such a nearby distance in exquisite detail and actually be able to follow it 
across the electromagnetic spectrum. And this uh, explosion that we observed is going to be detectable for at least a year, is the current estimate, and it could even go on for longer. So right now we're just trying to obtain the best data set we can at optical, infrared, radio, and X-ray wavelengths. And once we put together this data set, we can begin to model the explosion properties and that will be when we really get to shed some light on what, how different this explosion was and whether there's some new physical processes that are going on that we need to start considering when studying gamma ray bursts. That's Brendan O'Connor from the George Washington University. And this is Space Time. Still to come, a new study identifies the mechanism driving the sun's fast solar winds. And NASA's Mars Ingenuity helicopter suddenly goes silent on the red planet. All that and more still to come on Space Time. A new study has finally worked out how the sun generates winds of more than 1.6 million kilometres an hour. The findings, reported in the journal Nature, show that the energy released from magnetic fields near the sun's surface are powerful enough to drive these fast solar winds, which are made up of ionized particles or plasmas that flow outwards from the sun, enveloping the entire solar system. The findings are based on new data obtained by NASA's Parker Solar Probe, which is studying the sun in extreme detail. The sun's solar wind forms a giant magnetic bubble known as the heliosphere. This protects the planets in the solar system from the barrage of high-energy cosmic rays that are whipping around the rest of the galaxy. However, the solar wind also carries its own high-energy particles as well as part of the sun's magnetic field. And this crashes into the Earth's magnetosphere, causing disturbances called space weather or geomagnetic storms. These storms occur when the sun experiences more than usual turbulent activity, including things like solar flares and enormous explosions of plasma into space known as coronal mass ejections. These geomagnetic storms are responsible for the spectacular auroral light shows often seen near Earth's polar regions, the northern and southern lights, the aurora borealis and aurora australis. But they can also do a lot of damage. They can knock out a city's power grid, disrupt navigation and communication systems, damage or even destroy spacecraft, and expose people in high-altitude aircraft or in space to high doses of radiation. One of the study's authors, James Drake from the University of Maryland, says the solar wind carries lots of information about the sun to the Earth, so understanding the mechanism behind the sun's solar wind is important. Previous studies had already revealed that the sun's magnetic field was somehow driving the solar wind. But researchers didn't really understand the underlying mechanism. Then earlier this year, Drake co-authored a paper which argued that the heating and acceleration of the solar wind was being driven by magnetic reconnection, a process that Drake had dedicated his scientific career to studying. The authors explained that the surface of the sun is covered in tiny jetlets of hot plasma and these are propelled upwards by magnetic reconnection, which occurs when magnetic fields pointing in opposite directions suddenly cross-connect. That cross-connection in turn triggers the release of massive amounts of energy. It's a case of two things in opposite directions often winding up annihilating each other, and in the process, releasing massive amounts of magnetic energy. Drake says solar flares and coronal mass ejections on the sun are all driven by that mechanism. To better understand these processes, Drake and colleagues used data from the Parker Solar Probe to analyse the plasma flowing out from the corona, the sun's outermost and hottest layer. In April 2021, Parker became the first spacecraft to enter the sun's corona and has been nudging ever closer to the sun's surface ever since. The data cited in this paper was taken at a distance of 13 solar radii, roughly 9 million kilometres from the sun's surface. And using this new data, Drake and colleagues were able to provide the first characterization of the bursts of magnetic energy that occur in coronal holes, which are openings in the sun's magnetic field and the source of the solar wind. The authors demonstrated that the magnetic reconnection between open and closed magnetic fields, known as the interchange connection, is a continuous process rather than a series of isolated events as previously thought. This led them to conclude that the rate of magnetic energy release, which drives the outbound jet of heated plasma, was powerful enough to overcome gravity and produce the sun's solar winds. 
By understanding these smaller releases of energy that are constantly occurring on the Sun, researchers hope to better understand and possibly even predict the larger, more dangerous eruptions which launch plasma out into space towards the Earth. In addition to the implications for Earth, these findings can also be applied to other areas of astronomy. See, stellar winds from other stars also play a crucial role in shielding their planetary systems from cosmic rays, which can impact habitability. But at the same time, those stellar winds, if they're too powerful, can also blow away a planet's atmosphere and even irradiate its surface, preventing life from forming, a process we're seeing in action today on the red planet Mars. This is Space Time. Still to come... NASA's Mars Ingenuity helicopter suddenly goes silent on the surface of the red planet, and later in the science report, claims that an artificial intelligent drone attacked its operator in order to complete its mission have been rejected by the US Air Force. All that and more still to come on Space Time. NASA's Mars Ingenuity helicopter has suddenly gone silent on the surface of the red planet. The loss of contact lasted six days before the tiny chopper finally re-established communication. Mission managers at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, believe the issue was caused by a combination of the challenging topography, including a ridgeline between the Perseverance rover and Ingenuity, which was affecting radio communications between the two vehicles, made worse by Perseverance being positioned in such a way that its communications antenna was being blocked by the rover's other equipment from getting a good line of sight to the chopper's position. Combined with weakening batteries aboard Ingenuity allowed brownout conditions to occur. This incident wasn't the first time the tiny tissue box sized rotocopter experienced a blackout, but it was by far the worst. A brief two day loss of signal happened about a year ago. That was also caused by the chopper's batteries not getting enough charge from the solar array as Jezero Crater moved into the Martian winter. On that occasion, the reduced voltage reset Ingenuity's mission clock, causing the helicopter's systems to be out of sync with the Perseverance rover. Mission managers quickly resolved the issue, but they knew it could happen again. Still, Ingenuity has already well outperformed its original mission targets. The 1.8 kilogram robotic helicopter arrived on the Red Planet attached to the Perseverance rover back in February 2021. Ingenuity was only ever designed to undertake five or six demonstration test flights simply to show that humans could fly an aircraft on another planet. So the fact that it's now undertaken 51 flights is absolutely astounding. And it's proven to be a huge help for mission managers scouting ahead of Perseverance, looking for the best route and spotting interesting rocks. Mission managers know Ingenuity's time is running out. Even with the imminent return of the Martian summer, the chopper's batteries are nearing the end of their useful lives, and the solar array is covered in a growing film of dust. So brownouts are going to become more common, and eventually they will take the life of the intrepid little chopper. This is Space Time. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A United States Air Force colonel now claims he misspoke when he described an experiment in which an artificial intelligence-enabled drone opted to attack its operator in order to complete its mission. The chief of AI test and operations, Colonel Tucker Hamilton, had earlier told a Royal Aeronautical Society conference that an AI-enabled drone was repeatedly stopped from completing its task of destroying surface-to-air missile sites by its human operator. Hamilton said that in the end, despite having been trained not to kill its operator, the drone destroyed the communications tower so the operator could no longer tell it what to do, thereby allowing it to complete its mission. Hamilton now claims that the simulation never actually took place and it was all just a thought experiment. Scientists have developed a new tool that can, with 99% accuracy, identify academic papers written by the artificial intelligence chatbot ChatGPT. 
The findings, published in the journal Cell Reports Physical Science, involved researchers training a chat GPT to be a better science writer using 64 perspective articles written in science journals which provided an overview of specific research topics. ChatGPT was then ordered to compose 128 articles based on these perspective pieces. The authors say ChatGPT gives itself away because it's so predictable. Using simpler paragraph structures than human authors, more uniform sentence lengths, and a more consistent number of words per paragraph. Vocabulary apparently also differs, with humans more likely to use words such as however, but, and although, while ChatGPT was more likely to use words others and researchers. Feeding this information into their tool, they were able to spot ChatGPT articles with 100% accuracy and individual paragraphs with 92% accuracy. Scientists have set a new world record for the fastest ever industry standard optical fibre, carrying the equivalent of more than 10 million fast home internet connections, all of them running at full capacity. And all of this through a fibre cable less than the thickness of a human hair. The new record, reported at the 46th Optical Fibre Communications Conference, was achieved by a team of Australian, Japanese, Dutch and Italian researchers. They pushed some 1.7 petabytes over a 67-kilometre long piece of fibre. The fibre, which contains 19 cores that can each carry a signal, meets the global standard for fibre size, ensuring that it can be adopted without massive infrastructure change. And it uses less digital processing, thereby greatly reducing the power acquired per bit transmitted. Apple looks like it's about to revolutionise the world again with its new Vision Pro headset. The spectacular new virtual and augmented reality device looked like a pair of ski goggles, but ones which will expand your virtual world, that's if you can afford the price. With the details, we're joined by technology editor Alex saharov Royt from techadvice.life. The big news, of course, was Vision Pro, which Apple is calling a spatial computer. They're not calling it a VR headset or an AR headset. Uh, they didn't use the term AI. They talked about machine learning. They didn't use the term the metaverse because this is different to most other headsets. It's not just enveloping you in VR that uh, you can't sort of look through, although on the MetaQuest 2, you can actually have a mode where you can see outside. It's black and white. And on the MetaQuest 3 that's coming soon, it will be full color to see through. But the AR that Facebook is working on isn't quite the same. Meta talks about 500 apps for its MetaQuest 2. The Vision Pro not only runs hundreds of thousands of iPad and iPhone apps, but you can also extend your Mac screen to it, and it's got its own apps, which look very similar to the ones that you're used to today on your iPhone and iPad. And so even though it's unreleased to the public, it's got hundreds of thousands of apps ready to go. And you can position various app windows, be they iPhone apps, iPad apps, browsers, looking at your photos, taking photos and videos in 3D. You can do see all that in front of you in this canvas that can be as large as you like. You can also, with a twist, of the dial, you can actually block out the rest of the world and have what appears to be a virtual reality headset, and you can have this giant 100-inch or larger screen in front of you with a beautiful mountain scene behind you, and it can be on a plane, and you can just block the rest of the world out. It's really quite uh, special, and you do have to look at the 9-minute and 12-second video that Apple has for Vision Pro to truly appreciate it, and if you like that and you want a deeper dive, the second half of the two-hour keynote is dedicated to Vision Pro, so it doesn't have controls. It's controlled by very simple hand gestures, unlike MetaQuest and Vive where you've got these controllers, and it really does look to be like a new class of computing device. Uh, Tim Cook said that you don't look at it, you look through it. And it even does things like allow people to see your eyes because it's got a screen on the inside and it's got a screen on the outside that is displaying what your eyes look like. So when people are speaking to you, then they're right next to you. They get a sense that you're with them. And uh, no other headset does this. There's 12 cameras. There's a bunch of microphones. You know, even when you do a FaceTime call, when you set up the Vision Pro for the first time, it's doing a scan of your face in, in 3D and it's recreating a 3D avatar of your face. So some people were saying, oh, you must have to use your iPhone. But no, it's uh, smart enough to set that uh, little avatar up. And, uh, you know, as a version one product, and I always say don't buy version one, this is very polished. It's taken advantage of years of work that Apple has done in augmented reality and widgets and in all of the things that it's, it's good at, even the AirPod Max headset with its various materials and the digital crown on the AirPod 
you know, Pods Max and on your watch. I mean, all those have come together to make what is arguably the most polished version one product the world has ever seen. And it still won't arrive until 2024 at the earliest, um, you know, in the first part of 2024. And at that only in the US, it'll be $3,499, not including taxes. In Australia, that's at least $5,200, not including the GST. So it's expensive. But if you were to buy all those gadgets, multiple monitors and powerful uh, Mac or iPad, try to do all that stuff together and get a VR headset of some sort, it would end up costing you more than that. So um, it's a version one product and it's looking thus far really good. Yeah, this was the undoubted highlight of WWWDC 2023, Apple's annual developer conference, but it wasn't the only announcement. What else was there? They started with three Macs, the MacBook Air 15, new Mac Studio, and the new Mac Pro. Both those two are using M2 Pro Max and Ultra processors, and the MacBook Air 15 is exactly like the MacBook Air 13, except with a 15.3-inch screen. We also saw previews of iOS 17, iPad OS 17, Mac OS Sonoma, what iOS 10 and also improvements for the HomePod and Apple TV and, and the headline features for iOS 17 are things like being able to listen to people leaving you a voicemail in real time and seeing the transcription and then choosing to answer should you wish so that as people are leaving a message you can choose to answer. I remember doing that on a Nokia 17 years ago with an app that turned your phone into an answering machine. Pixel users have been able to do it for a while. It's finally there. Also if you get a voicemail that you're not listening to live you'll see a transcription of that voicemail. Very handy if you can't answer a call and you want to know if that is an important message or not. And look, there's stacks of other features, the ability to check in, improvements to messages. I mean, all sorts of things. Go and watch the keynote. Go to techadvice.life. I've got the three main videos on an article there. You can also find it at Apple and at Apple's YouTube page. That's Alex Sahara of Royd from techadvice.life. That's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash space time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 